Hi everyone. Um, today I want to talk about uh, the design limitation of bulk carriers and how it contributes to structural failures. The reason I want to do that is because in the past uh, many bulk carriers have uh, experienced structural failures because of which they have sunk in the sea or it has resulted in loss of cargo or even uh, death of lives at sea. Um, many um, maritime stakeholders such as classification societies, uh, ship owners or cargo shippers are particularly concerned with the possible damage and uh, loss of bulk carriers because of uh, unequal loading that has led to structural failure. And that is because uh, many a times uh, people involved in the loading of ships do not understand the design limitations or structural limitations of bulk carriers. Now it is uh, of particular concern to classification societies and mariners and shippers that uh, people who are involved in the loading of cargo do not have a clear understanding of the limitations that is imposed by the ship's classification society regarding the strength capability of the hull structure. And that is why today I will take you through a typical structure of a bulk carrier and then I will highlight the design limitations and then how it leads to structural failures and why you should be avoiding uh, loading the vessel in a certain way to avoid such failures. All right, so let's get going. So before I start uh, with the design limitations of the bulk carriers, you must understand how is a typical bulk carrier structured or what is the structural configuration of a typical bulk carrier. Now I'll show you a few diagrams uh, on your screen so that you see is that uh, the most widely recognized structural arrangement identified with the bulk carrier is a single deck ship with a double bottom, hopper tanks, uh, then you see single skin transverse framed side shell, then top side tanks and deck hatchways. So you can see here that uh, a typical transverse section in way of cargo hold and a longitudinal section of a typical corrugated transverse watertight bulkhead uh, is also seen here. Now bulk carrier design does not alter significantly with size. Uh, fundamentally a bulk carrier usually has the same structural configuration with irrespective of the dead weight. So say imagine a, a, a 30 or 40,000 dead weight ship will have the same kind of structural configuration as a 80,000 or a 90,000 uh, tons of dead weight of bulk carrier. Now in my previous screen I showed you a typical cargo hold structural configuration of a single side skin bulk carrier. Uh, what you see here now on your screen is the nomenclature for typical transverse section in way of a cargo hold that I was talking before. So you can see that in general the plating comprising structural items such as the side shell, the bottom shell, the strength deck, transverse bulkheads, then you have the inner bottom and top side and hopper tanks. Uh, you have the sloping plating of the hopper tanks providing local boundaries of the structure and it carries static and dynamic pressure loads exerted by the cargo, bunkers, ballast and the sea. Now this as plating is supported by the secondary stiffening members such as frames and longitudinals. Now these secondary members transfer the load to primary structural members such as the double bottom floors and girders or the transverse web frames in top side and hopper tanks. So I have labeled the hopper tanks and the top side tanks as well as the double bottoms just to give you an idea what I'm talking about. So you can see here the slope of the hopper tanks and how it contributes to transfer of load from inner structural members to the primary structural members of the secondary structural members to the primary structural members. Then the transverse bulkhead structures that includes its upper and lower stools together with the cross deck and the double bottom structures are the main structural members that you can see here on your screen. And this provides the transverse strength of the ship to prevent the hull section from distorting under any kind of load. Now in addition, if ingress of water into any one of these holes occurs, the transverse water bright bulkheads, they are the ones that prevent any kind of progressive flooding into the other holes. So you can see here um, how the uh, 
typical corrugated transverse watertight bulkhead cross section has been shown to you in the last screen and this screen here as well. Now that you understand the design limitations, or rather, sorry, the typical structure of a, a structural configuration of a typical bulk carrier, we can now go into the design limitations. Now, all these bulk carriers are designed with limitations imposed upon their um, operability to ensure that the structural integrity is maintained. Therefore, if you exceed these limitations, it may result in the overstressing of the ship structure and that sometimes lead to catastrophic failures where there could be loss of cargo, uh, sinking of ships, loss of lives. Now the ship's approved loading manual, it provides a description of the operational loading conditions upon which the design of the hull structure uh, has been based. Now the loading instrument provides a means to readily calculate the still water shearing forces and bending moments in any load or ballast condition and then assess these values against the design limits. Now, ship structure is designed to withstand the static and dynamic loads likely to be experienced by the ship throughout its service life. The loads acting on the hull structure when a ship is floating in still or calm water are static loads. These loads are imposed by the actual weight of the ship structure, the outfitting equipment, machinery weights, uh, then you have the cargo load or the cargo weights, you have the bunker and uh, other consumable loads, you have the ballast water weight and you have the pressure that is exerted by the seawater all around the ship's hull that is called the hydrostatic pressure. Now, addition to these static weights, you have the dynamic loads and they are those additional loads exerted on the ship's hull structure through the action of the waves and the effects of the resultant ship motions. So you have the acceleration forces, you have the slamming and the sloshing loads so the sloshing loads, if you don't know what it is, they are induced on the ship's internal structure through the movement of the fluids in tanks or holds, while slamming of the bottom shell structure forward may occur due to the emergence of the forward end of the ship from the sea in heavy weather. So you can see when the ship is panting or when it is pitching, uh, so it goes into the water and comes out of the water and then it slams on it. These are the slamming loads and because of the ship's motions when the liquids are freely sloshing about in the tanks, that is the sloshing load and that is why uh, you know that free surface effect is created which results in the lowering of the vessel's overall GM and their low overall stability. So cargo overloading in individual hold spaces will increase the static stress levels in the ship's structure and it will reduce the strength capability of the structure to sustain the dynamic loads exerted in uh, such kind of rough and adverse sea conditions. Now all bulk carriers are, that are classed with the classification societies are assigned permissible still water shearing forces and the still water bending moments and there are limits to it. So there are normally two sets of permissible shearing forces, uh, still water shearing forces and still water bearing, bending moments assigned to each ship and they are called sea going still water shearing force and still water bending moment limits and then you have the harbor or in port still water shearing forces and still water bending moments so uh, one is for the sea going one is for the harbor these are the limits assigned to each vessel now the sea going still water shearing force and still water bending moment limits are not to be exceeded when the ship puts to sea or during any part of the sea going voyage in harbor where the ship is in sheltered water and is subjected to reduced dynamic loads, the hull girder is permitted to carry a higher level of stress imposed by the static loads. Now the harbor still water shearing force and still water bending moment limits are not to be exceeded during any stage of cargo operations that are carried out in the harbor or in the port. When a ship is floating in still water, the ship's lightweight that is the weight of the ship structure and the machinery and dead weight. So that is the all other weights such as the weight of the bunkers, ballast, provisions, cargo. They are all supported by the global buoyancy upthrust created on the exterior of the hull. So you know if a ship is floating in water, there is some a force of buoyancy that is exerted on it because of the uh, this is natural. So there is gravity acting downwards and buoyancy of the water acting upwards. Now along the ship's length, there will be local differences in the vertical forces of buoyancy and the ship's weight. Now these unbalanced net vertical forces acting along the length of the ship will cause the hull girder to shear 
that I showed you in a couple of screens before and then to bend that I showed you in the previous slide. And that induces a vertical still water shear force and still water bending moment at each section of the hull. What you see here now is hogging in still water. So at sea the ship is subjected to cyclical shearing and bending actions that is induced by continuously changing wave pressures acting on the hull. These cyclical shearing and bending actions give rise to an additional component of dynamic wave induced shearing force and bending moment in the hull girder. At any one time the hull girder is subjected to a combination of still water as well as wave induced shearing force and bending moments. Now the stresses in the hull section caused by these shearing forces and bending moments are carried by continuous longitudinal structural members. These structural members are the strength deck, side shell and the bottom shell plating and longitudinals, inner bottom plating and longitudinals, double bottom girders and top side and hopper tank sloping plating and longitudinals which are defined as the hull girder and that is why I took you through a structure of a typical bulk carrier so that you can understand the different parts of the structural members that I'm talking about. So you can see here, um, these are examples of permissible and calculated still water shearing force and still water bending moments that I am trying to show you here. So this is the relationship of the permissible still water shearing force and the calculated still water shearing force. And in this diagram, of course, I'm showing you the relationship between the permissible still water bending moments and the calculated still water bending moments. So what is allowed and what uh, results from a uh, loading. Uh, so if you have loaded, you have to make sure you have loaded the vessel. So you have to make sure that you do not cross or do not exceed uh, these limits that have been imposed by the uh, that have been imposed by the classification society because during construction of the vessel it is pretty much uh, simulated in different scenarios and uh, they know how a vessel will behave under different loading conditions at sea and that is how they calculate all these uh, permissible limits and the vessels should not be exceeding these limits when loading the vessel with the cargo now to enhance the safety and flexibility some bulk carriers are provided with local loading criteria which define the maximum allowable cargo weight in each cargo hold and each pair of adjacent cargo holds that is block hold loading condition for various ship draft conditions. So the local loading criteria is normally provided in tabular and diagrammatic form. Overloading will induce greater stresses in the double bottom, transverse bulkheads, hatch combings, hatch corners, main frames, and associated brackets of individual cargo holds. I'll show you a figure. So you can see here how the double bottom cross deck and transverse bulkhead structures, they are designed for specific cargo loads and sailing draft conditions. Now these structural con configurations are sensitive to the net vertical load acting on the ship's double bottom. So the net vertical load is the difference between the vertical downward weight of the cargo and water ballast in the double bottom and the hopper ballast tanks in way of the cargo hold and upward buoyancy force which is dependent on the ship's draft. Now that is why these days if you go for your oral examination, especially your chief mate's oral examination, the surveyor often asks your question to load a bulk carrier. He will give you these um, different parameters, he will give you specifications of a vessel, the capacities of different cargo holds uh, and then he will ask you to load the cargo hold and what he or she wants to see is whether you are leading, you are uh, the way you are loading the ship, does it lead to any kind of stresses that may be developed or hogging or sagging conditions which may further deform the vessel or cause structural deficiency. So overloading of the cargo hold in association with uh, insufficient draft will result in an excessive net vertical load on the double bottom which may distort the overall structural configuration in way of the hold. I'll show you how. So you can see here how the cargo weight uh, is causing some kind of deformity it is causing uh, excessive or net vertical load you can see how the cargo weight is acting vertically so it is creating some kind of a vertical load on the double bottom and that double bottom may distort 
because of this excessive vertical load and then you know that the because the ship is floating in the water there is always an excessive uh, not an excessive but there is always a force that is the force of buoyancy that is acting from downward so that that exerts a pressure the hydrostatic water the water pressure exerts a pressure and along with that if you load cargo beyond the permissible limit then of course that exerts a pressure as well and that is why it can result in the um, deformation of cargo or deformation of other structure so here you can see how the excessive flexural deformation of the double bottom structure is taking place due to the cargo weight that is uh, acting on the structure now uh, a typical local loading diagram for a cargo hold uh, that is a strengthened hold combined with the adjacent hold limits for bulk carriers is now shown on your screen. So the important trend to note from this diagram is that there is a reduction in the cargo carrying capacity of a hold with a reduction in the mean draft. So to exceed these limits will impose high stresses in the ship structure in way of the overloaded cargo hold. Now there are two sets of local loading criteria depending upon the cargo load distribution namely individual hold loading or two adjacent hold loading so the allowable cargo loads for each hold or combined cargo loads in two adjacent holds are usually provided in association with a empty double bottom and hopper wing ballast tanks directly in way of the cargo hold so when water ballast is carried in the double bottom and hopper wing tanks the maximum allowable cargo weight should be obtained by deducting the weight of the water ballast being carried in the tanks in way of the cargo hold all right because otherwise it exerts an additional pressure so if you are already carrying uh, ballast water in the tanks then you will reduce the amount of uh, cargo that are, you are loading in that hold if you are carrying empty tanks then you can of course load more cargo it is basically to equalize the pressure or equalize the load that acts on the ship structure so the maximum cargo loads that is given in the local loading criteria should be considered in association with the mean draft in way of the cargo holds. So in the case of a single cargo hold, the ship draft at the mid length of the hold should be used. And for two adjacent cargo holds, the average of the draft in the mid length of each cargo hold should be used. So I'll stop this video now here. And in my next video, I'll also talk about how the cargo should be distributed along the ship's length. Uh, so we'll talk about homogeneous hold loading conditions, alternate hold loading conditions. I'll show you examples of each with diagrams so that you get an idea of how to do it. We'll also talk about block hold loading and part loaded conditions because uh, whether you are sailing on bulk carriers or not sailing on bulk carriers, you should understand all these principles, especially when you go for exams, you will be expected to know about every type of ship. Uh, because if you are going to get your chief mates license or your second mates license they expect you to know about every type of ship and these are basic knowledge that you must know so that tomorrow if you are asked any questions about cargo loading on such type of ships or bulk carriers you may talk about this so even if you can talk about this the server will be impressed with your knowledge although you may not have any practical experience but if you have the theoretical background and theoretical knowledge uh, they will be impressed and they will know that uh, you can be trusted on such ships with achievement license all right guys uh, so all the best let me know what you thought about this video and i look forward to your feedback bye for now